call to order the regular city commission meeting for July 6, 2022. Let the record show that all commissioners are present. First item up is the order of business. Mr. Dossinger, are there any changes to the order of business? Uh, good evening, Mr. President, members of the commission. There is no change to the order of business. Thank you. Any questions on the order of business? Not, I'd look for a motion. Move to approve. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Bear. Second. Second by Commissioner Frederick. Any further discussion? All in favor, state aye. 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 Motion carries. Next item up is the consent agenda. Are there any items on the consent agenda that the commissioners wish to discuss? Hearing no discussion, I'd look for a motion. Move to approve. Second. Motion to approve by uh, Commissioner Frederick, second by Commissioner Soboluk. Any further discussion on the consent agenda? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Mrs. Soboluk? Aye. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Mr. Bear? Aye. Motion uh, Chair uh, votes aye. Motion carries. Moving into the agenda, we have first item up is our discussion on the sales tax discussion. And it is a consideration to approve a resolution and this will be handled by City Attorney Wenko. Thank you, Mr. President. Commissioners, enclosed in your packet is the proposed resolution for the uh, sales tax increase. Uh, just for purposes of clarification, uh, we did discuss this at the last uh, City Commission meeting. Uh, and, and for your awareness, as well as for the public, a uh, reminder that this is just one way to initiate the sales tax increase. Uh, this does not mean that the sales tax will increase. So I, I say that for the recognition for the public. Uh, there will be a vote that has to occur, uh, and that will take place at a later date and time. Uh, but this is just to initiate that uh, so the city can get the election process started to organize the public vote. And I'd stand for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Winko. Uh, any questions on the resolution? And for the general public's um, information, this is the city of Dickinson wanting to initiate a one cent sales tax increase from six and a half percent to seven and a half percent. The maximum allowable sales tax that we can have is eight percent. The state collects five percent out of that. Uh, currently, the city collects one point five percent sales tax there are certain items that are exempt um, medicine food um, with a car when you buy a car you only pay the five percent sales tax to the state you don't pay a city sales tax and I think um, farm implement is also exempt I think you do pay sales tax on parts so and we would take uh, the 1% and dedicate 40% of that to property tax reduction, 30% to city projects such as city infrastructure or um, if the city needs new buildings or updating on buildings. And then the other 30% we would dedicate towards quality of life features, um, much like we just dedicated some money to the, the sports complex, to the CTE, and there's discussions of um, us doing some other projects too. I know there's the, the hockey club has been in front of us. There's an arts club that is looking for possible assistance getting their projects. Um, and commissioners, I'm, I'm sure you've been contacted by other groups too that are, are looking for different items the the city the other 30 percent that would go towards city projects could be anywhere from updating a building like our baylor building um, 
possibility of when we were talking about a training center or, or for our police and fire, uh, we're talking about expanding our dinosaur museum, which um, is, is badly needed. And we're also talking about expanding our library. So all that, that money would be sp spread between a multitude of projects. But the primary is to help with uh, property tax reduction, 40% of this 1%. So the resolution here that will be uh, on the ballot, if we so do uh, adopt this, would read, the, shall the city of Dickinson adopt an ordinance number, which would be 2020-22, I mean 20-2022, um, as published in the Dickinson Press on whatever date they publish, which will implement an additional 1% sales use and gross receipts tax within the city of Dickinson, dedicating revenues collected by the tax, less administrative expenses to fund property tax reduction, special, special community projects and city capital projects. And then on the ballot, it would read yes, uh, yes vote means to approve the proposed ordinance and a no would mean to reject the proposed ordinance. So commissioners, any discussion? And Mr. President, just so for clarification, so if this is passed, the ordinance will be published and so we'll have a different ordinance number for that. Um, so that will be fully available and reviewable for the public to review as well. What's the resolution number on this one? Uh, it would be 20-2022. Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. President, I move to approve resolution number 20-2022. I, I second that. We have a motion to approve resolution 20-2022 by Commissioner Oderman, second by Commissioner Bear. Discussion, commissioners, questions? Hearing no discussion, we'll vote. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Dr. Bear? Here. Aye. <laughs> Mr. Frederick? Aye. Mrs. Sobolak? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Our next item up, we have a report, and this will be handled by City uh, Interim City Administrator Dossinger, and it's a thank you note. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the City of Dickinson did receive two thank you notes. Uh, the first one is from Elder Care. Elder Care had received a $6,600 uh, check from the Dickinson City Sales Tax Grant Program. Um, they are using that funding to improve a landscaping project uh, at that public transit facility. Uh, the second one did come from the City of Reader. Uh, the, the Prairie Pioneers from Reader had purchased uh, automatic door openers, which they found very helpful for, for their elderly people. So two thank you <coughs> notes that we did receive within the last uh, week. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dossinger. Our next item on the agenda this evening is the fire department, and they have their monthly report. Welcome, Chief Presnell. Thanks, President Decker and Commissioners. Um, I'm before you tonight to present the June report for the fire department. Uh, June was an extremely busy month, um, but just a reminder of the services we do provide, they go, do, they go a little beyond just uh, fire protection. Um, we do the whole gamut. Uh, we did respond to 93 calls, which is an actual um, record for the fire department. That's the most calls that the fire department has ever responded to in a single month. Uh, that does put us at about 446 calls, and it is an 11% increase that we're seeing from last year. Calls by month, as you can see, that, that 93 is a pretty large jump compared to where we're normally at um, for the last two years. Call types, uh, we had several fires. We did have three structure fires this month that were pretty significant calls, and one is being investigated <coughs> as an arson. It is still under investigation. That's being handled between us and the Dickinson Police Department. Uh, but false alarms were pretty high for us. We did see a lot of those calls. EMS calls, as always, are way up there. 
a lot of the false alarms did come from the storms that we did receive, uh, setting off um, alarm systems in different businesses. The water getting in tends to cause a lot of problems. Chief for excuse me, Chief for the just for the general public, the good intent calls. Um, generally, what the what are those entail? The good intent calls specifically in this report, uh, when we had the hell storm, we had to pull a lot of people out that got stuck in hell in the, the hell piles. That's where those came from. They could be that as far as us going and rescuing a cat from a tree, or if you follow our Facebook, a parrot, um, like we did last month or in June as well. So it, it, it's kind of all encompassing. If it's not an actual call, it kind of falls into good intent calls. Okay. Calls by station, um, like always, uh, station one calls south of the freeway. That tends to be our, our higher frequency area for calls, um, where we did respond to about 57 south of the freeway and about 33. Here's a little heat map of where all of our calls kind of occur. You can see they're, they're spread out all over the place, but the majority are south of that freeway. Response times, we did go up a little bit and a lot of that had to do with us um, actually moving out of Fire Station 1 temporarily for the last couple of weeks while there were some repairs done and we're now responding out of the Public Safety Center. So that has added a lot to our response. It's not a significant amount. Um, as you can see, we're definitely still within what that benchmark is of the five minutes and 20 seconds, but it did add a little, probably about 15 seconds to our overall response average. Training hours, we completed over a thousand training hours this month. We did bring in a driver operator course that all of our full-time staff attended. And I just found out today that everybody did pass that certification test. It was put on by the Alabama Fire College. So somebody from Alabama actually came down here and taught it for us. So, because the state does not offer that certification yet. Uh, that does put us about 4,000, just over 4,000 training hours for the year, which puts us at our, you know, about 70% of our overall training hour requirement for ISO. Um, and like I said, that was driver operator. We did send two to a live fire instructor training up in Williston to get that certification. Um, some NFPA drills and then EMS and, in, and then some instru other instructor courses. Fire prevention completed 60 routine inspections for the month, uh, 49 fire prevention activities and five certificate occupancies. Those fire prevention activities are us um, uh, having uh, station tours, going out to schools, stuff like that. So that, that's anything that's not inspection related. So we we're, were fairly busy on that side of it, a little slower in our actual um, inspection, um, the inspections for the month. Here's some of the community activities. Uh, I honestly don't know where they found the goats, but they had goats and they all got sent to me. Had a couple of, yeah, I, I have no more to add to that one. Uh, a couple station tours. Uh, we did uh, participate in the Guns and Hoses softball game. And then, of course, they found some Dalmatians that everybody loved. So do you have Dalmatians running around the firehouse? We do not. So I'm, I'm, no, we do not. Everybody wants it until they have to clean up after it. So, yeah. um, and then of course we participated in the city's open house with a booth and then uh, having the truck out front. And then with that, I could I'd gladly answer any questions. On the recruitment end for the volunteer or the part time, as we're designating them now. How are we doing on that? This month was actually a pretty good month um, because of our high school program. Um, and then we just kind of blitzed Facebook pretty hard with, with recruitment. We are at five that we've brought on this month. I guess technically this month we have a couple starting next week, but we did conduct all the interviews um, for three of our high school uh, fire academy um, individuals that will be coming onto the department. Okay. I'm always curious, and it's that time of year. How were the calls this last weekend? It was honestly not that bad. Good. Uh, the rain helped quite a bit. We, I think, had one firework call. The rest were all storm-related calls, so not that bad. Well, that's great news. So you brought up about the junior 
firefighters. I was just the um, the high school program. Yep. I was just wondering if you could give us an update on the uh, uh, young lady that was sent into competition. How did she do? I believe she actually placed placed tenth at nationals. Mm -hmm. So um, I, from what I understand, there was like fifty nine competing in in that. She was the only female competing, and she did place tenth. Awesome. So nice. top ten for the first time that we've ever been involved in the fire side of it. The the rest of the um, competitors are from very very big like uh, academy programs. Um, so it was really nice that we had somebody place tenth at nationals with that. That's awesome. That's setting the bar high for next year though. <laughs> it is. We're we're out there <laughs> recruiting like like you guys do in football. So we got. Yeah. It. Okay. Any other questions? Chief Presnell. All right, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Our next item up, we have our planning, and we have a Renaissance Zone Development Amendment for the Prairie Hills Mall Third Subdivision and the Prairie Hills Walmart Subdivision. And this will be handled by City County Planner Josephson. Welcome. Yes, thank you, President Decker, Co um, City Commissioner Steve Josephson. Um, this was an item that went in front of the, the Planning and Zoning Commission back in May. I was uh, out of the country for a while, so it's coming, to you, it's coming to you now. And this is a proposal to expand the city's Renaissance Zone from 39 blocks to 41, to 41 blocks. Let me see if I can get this. There we go. It doesn't show, show everything in there. Currently, the, the city has been participating in the Renaissance Zone program since the uh, you know since the uh, the early the early part of the century and I, I think you're all familiar with it but the idea is that within an area that's considered blighted or in need of of of, Im of improvements if it's an older area the city can offer a tax incentive property tax incentive to um, you know to developers and property owners who you know want to who want to develop a property property as long as for residential it's at least 20% of the of the city's assessed value or at least 50% the improvements that is or at least 50% of the assessed of the assessed value in the past when the city has has expanded its renaissance zone it's been along east and east and west west Villard. the the, the century code does allow for for a city to create what's known as a non-contiguous island of up to three blocks, and you know the staff discussion was that that um, the area where Prairie Hills Mall is and the area just to the north of it, where Runnings and a number of other businesses are, including a vacant the vacant supermarket, uh, would be prime you know could be prime projects because the city's population increased to 25,000. The Century Code allows the city to add two new two more blocks to it. Um, staff has talked to the mall, the mall manager about this, and I believe we're, they were in discussions with, with someone who was looking at developing, you know, developing uh, a development where the old, where the vacant supermarket is. This has gone to city, to the city planning and zoning commission, both planning and zoning commission, and staff recommend approval. Um, now this is just this is just provides the opportunity. So uh, those individual developers or property owners still have to come before the planning and zoning commission and city commission to get approval for individual projects. This just expands the zone to two more blocks. I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Josephson. Any questions for Mr. Josephson on this amendment? Let's uh, call it, and this would be resolution 21-2022, and this again is the Renaissance Zone Development Amendment for the Perry Hills Mall Third Subdivision and the Perry Hills Walmart Subdivision. So that would include what, it's called the Walmart Subdivision, but it technically it has runnings, uh, the, the old vacated supermarket, uh, supermarket uh, Wendy's and the uh, O'Reilly's. Right, and, then, and, and, and some all of the mall complex, and and some potentially vacant, vacant, uh, you know, property to, property too, especially where where Perry Hills, right. Perry Hills Mall is. I guess it was called the Walmart subdivision because I understand there was an old Walmart. That's where Walmart. That was, was the original Walmart yeah. Runnings. Okay. Was the original Walmart. 
So. Yeah, it's been divvied up a number of times. So. Yeah, the, the, the thing that I, I, I just noticed uh, reviewing these documents was how many undeveloped lot, lots there are there that I did not know that were undeveloped lots. So uh, I mean, that there is an opportunity here, hopefully, for somebody to come in and, and, and develop this um, and maybe redevelop some of this space as well. Well, and there's potential there, too. You have a restaurant that's been sitting empty for Correct. how many years? Ten-plus years. So, 2014, I believe. 2014, it closed. So, eight years. So, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of potential in that area. So, I think this is a, a good location to pick, give people some opportunity. Again, it's, it's something that they would have to apply and come before us and uh, planning and zoning and then the city commission. So much like the rest of the Renaissance zone and, and just for the information, the Renaissance zone, the primary Renaissance zone runs from States, um, along Millard all the way to I think it's approximately fourth, it might fourth. End a little bit. And then there's some on the, you know, on right. the North, on the North side, you right. know, on the North side too. So there's all those opportunities and, um, there's a lot of opportunities within the city to, to use the renaissance so. so any other questions commissioners or comments uh, how often can we can we shift the the blocks in that renaissance zone like i mean is that kind of at our um it's our prerogative to be able to shift at, like let's say that there's a, a couple blocks that are in this contiguous zone here near villard that um, maybe we're not seeing the development in does it have to be in for a certain period of time or can we just kind of shift those as needed or if the century code provides i believe it's the the guidelines if they can be they can be moved what they have to show is that it's a non-productive block which means that nobody has taken advantage of that anywhere if you can find another block where there's a potential project the thing is that once a block is removed, you can't put it back yeah. in. And we have oh, done okay. that. And, that's, and, 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 and that was my understanding. I just wanted to, to ask that question for clarity for those who you know maybe aren't aware of that, that we, we can shift this um, as, as we see needed. But that's good information to have is that like once you remove a space from it that yeah. you can't put it back in there. Yeah. And Commissioner Oderman, there may be an opportunity to do that the uh, the original renaissance zone program expired after 15 years and it was renewed i believe back in 2019 for five years you can renew for five-year increments and say the city decided at the end of that five-year period i think it would be 2023 i think i'd have to go and check for sure if they wanted to renew you know come in and redo it for five more years certainly looking at you know, at the, the, the existing zone and seeing if there may be some other blocks, some blocks that are a block that's non-productive and another one that has potential, you know, for a project. It could, it could be done as part of the renewal too. So we, we had, um, at one point, we had proposed, and, and Mr. Josephson and myself and uh, Mr. Hadley, we had proposed moving some of the blocks next to DSU, giving them opportunities. It was not uh, met with the enthusiasm, enthusiasm that we we thought there would I, be. I think it turned into an opportunity to, for pe for people to, to to bear their grudges. Right. Their grudges about the city and not so much about right. you know the opportunities in the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. So we we'll have to you know we we do this every once in a while. We we uh, there was a, a large block on the south side of the tracks. That used to be part of this zone that nobody took advantage of, so we removed it, added it along Ballard more, given the you know Ballard a little bit of an opportunity to to develop some of this property along there. So right, and if I can, I know y'all have a public hearing coming up, but but um, if if I can just throw in an editorial comment, I think expanding along the west into that West Ballard commercial district is has helped out. I think there's been at least two projects that have come, 
that you know that that have come along, and then recently, just across the street, you know, the new restaurant that came in was a Renaissance Zone project. So we the last few years we've seen some opportunities. Sometimes people get them and they can't make it work. You know, that's a business thing, but at least the opportunity is there. Mm -hmm. Oh. I, like you said, Mr. Josephson, there are people that have taken advantage of the you know, business, bought a, an old laundromat and redid it, and yeah, it looks, looks fantastic. It's a and, beautiful building, though. Yeah. Um, there, I, I'm sure there's going to be other opportunities. Uh, that new coffee shop is part of it. Mm -hmm. um, the Bravera Bank downtown is part of it. Yeah, so. right. And as I said to Commissioner Friedrich early before the meeting started, if anybody talks about this, we'll probably run, we, we're gonna probably run another thing where we put out a mailer for this, but if any of you, if anyone talks to you and it's in this vicinity and they wanna remodel or do a new project, you know, please send them our way so we can see if they, see if they are, are in the Renaissance Zone and also if this is something that could help them. Okay, any other questions for Mr. Josephson or comments? Again, this is resolution 21 2022. I'd look for a motion. So move. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Frederick. Second. Second by Commissioner Oderman. Any further discussion? Comments or questions? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Mrs. Sobolok? Aye. Dr. Bear? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Josephson. Thank you very much. Our next item this evening, moving in, uh, and we're pretty close. I think there's a presentation that would lead us into the public hearing at 5 before that. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and uh, gooseneck development. Um, and this will be handled by Interim City Administrator Dossinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. At this time, I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Tom Pearson from Gooseneck Impl Implement to the podium. Um, today, we're going to have a discussion regarding uh, the Gooseneck development, that, which is proposed uh, just on the east of uh, Dickinson city limits. So, so welcome, Tom. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea of who we are. Uh, we're new to your guys' community. We, we uh, purchased the uh, Dakota Farm equipment back in July of 2018, so we're coming up on our four-year anniversary with that. So I just want to kind of, kind of show you who we are and what we're about. Uh, we're a John Deere dealership. We originally started in 1974 by Arlo, or excuse me, by uh, Daryl Borud. Uh, his son, Kevin, now is our majority owner of, of Gooseneck Implement. We are 13 locations. Basically, Highway 83 in the west of North Dakota is, is, is our territory. I'll show you here in just a moment. We have about 425 employees. We are looking at doing a new building facility in your guys' community. About an eight to nine million dollar investment in your community to bring in uh, a brand new uh, shop and, and, and retail outlet. As you can see, we're roughly about 405 million dollars in sales this year. Uh, we're we're a, a very large dealer for the for the for North Dakota. That map there is basically showing all of our 13 locations where there is a goose. That is where we have a store. As you can see, the northern half, that's our original eight stores that we've had. As you can see, we are very proactive in keeping our buildings very efficient for the changing of how equipment is getting so large. As you can see, we have built nine different facilities in the last 15 years. And we are pro working on doing two this year, one in Dickinson and one in Bowman, of the two that we purchased uh, back in, uh, in 18. First one that we did on the, uh, that was, was in Elgin. We did that because of the fire. That was part of the reason why we ac did the acquisition is to put in a new facility there. There's the future site. It's on the east side of town. It's just off to where the new uh, Interstate off-ramp was, was redone here. There's about 48 acres there. <clears throat> There's kind of a, what we're projecting. We're going to be coming back to uh, planning uh, at the end of the month here for the, for the site map. As you can see, that's a 68,000 square foot building that we'll be putting in there with an 18,000 foot 
cold storage building on the north side there. That roughly is going to sit on about 27 acres. We need to move roughly 200,000 cubic yards of dirt that we want to start this, this month on. We're going out for bids to get that done and get that started moving to make this project. So we need to get moving. We've been working on this since I think we acquired the land in November. Uh, I've been working with uh, the city officials for quite some time to get all, of, all the stuff that we need required to get it moving forward. Uh, some of the things that we're going to have on this is, like I said, it's, there's 30, just over 30,000 square feet in the shop, uh, just about uh, 30,000 square feet for our parts inventory for storage, and a closed storage building of 18,000. We put parts in enough, also customers' equipment for the winter for us to do it. There's also going to be a bulk fuel distribution center in there. Uh, wash bay and some overhead cranes and the overhead cranes this facility is uh, we did it in rugby that's a 68,000 square foot facility there sitting on a that dirt area there is 22 acres uh, we're going to roughly do about 27 on, on this thing is what our projections are our buildings are all steel buildings a lot of glass that's the shop in that. That is a 170 foot long shop. Uh, this one's probably going to be a little different design. Uh, and it's going to be longer than that. We have overhead cranes uh, in it. As you can see, they're using them. And then our port storage for our parts inventory warehouses. But why I'm here today is to, uh, we presented a developer's agreement uh, back in, I believe, late March. Uh, one of the requests that we're asking for is for consideration for city water and sewer uh, to be brought into that facility. We're willing to pledge $350,000 towards that, and that is what it would cost for us to do it. We have done it before, where we put our own fire suppression systems in it, our own s sewers. That's what it will cost us to do it. We can do it that way, but we would prefer to get the city's services, and that's what we're here to ask. I believe the city is going to provide the three different options that there were that they came up with that, that we're willing to participate, leaving it up to the city. We do not have one preferred option over the other. We're we're willing to work with them on any of that. Any questions for me? What's the plan with the existing building? It would be up for sale. Okay. Do you have any potential buyers or? Uh, we had somebody that was interested, but uh, timing-wise. This is going to take about two years to build. I'm going to be honest, we're already three months behind schedule. Sure. Um, it, so it could not work. So we'll be looking for a potential buyer. And so basically what you're looking for from us is you're not looking for us to actually pay for putting in any, you just want to be able to hook up to our, our services. Correct. You need to get okay. the services across the yep. interstate to okay. wait for us to hook up to, yes. Mr. Dossinger, you have some options? Uh, yes, I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Scott Schneider to the podium. I know that uh, uh, interim engineer Marshik and they've had had some discussions regarding some options in, in making this happen. So, Good, af good afternoon, Mayor Decker and Commissioners. <clears throat> so one of the challenges, um, uh, sorry, Scott Schneider with Apex Engineering Group. So one of the challenges with this area um, that was Start, we started looking at last fall with um, Planning Director Hadley at that time and, and the City Administrator was that this area north of the interstate and to the east here was actually not included in the urban service area in the comprehensive plan. And so what that means is the planning for water and sewer were not completed for this particular area. Um, so we were directed by Public Works Director Zaroff and Mr. Hadley to start looking at that. Um, there's a there's an ongoing um, effort to like look at this East Dickinson area. What does the land use look like? What, do, what is the planning involved in this whole area for roadways and transportation? The, some of the roadway networks have, have been planned out in the comprehensive plan. That gets a little complicated with their site plan. Um, we went back and forth a little bit on that. But anyways, on the water and sewer side, uh, we came up with some options to provide services to that area both on an interim basis to get them services, but it could also be used long-term if there's more growth in the city out there. So it's not just for this particular site. 
Um, the options we came up with, um, like like Tom said, there's there was three options for sewer, and the best one for sewer was, and I apologize, I didn't bring maps today. We can come back and and do that as a separate presentation, depending on where you want to go with this. But the best one for sewer was to cross the interstate uh, west of the interchange and come in behind um, the truck dealership out there north of the, the east business loop. And then water service was to come off of Energy Drive and serve it off the existing pressure zone by, by Public Works and then take water up into that area with a 12-inch line. But none of this is um, you know, inexpensive. We got to cross the interstate twice, once with water, one with sewer, once with sewer. And those estimates um, are in the ballpark of 1.7 to 1.9 million using today's construction dollars. They were a lot less a year and a half ago, and we, or a year ago when we started this process, and we're using 2021 estimates. Things have gone crazy. You guys know the cost estimating world we're in right now. Um, so those are the kind of dollars we're talking about to get water and sewer across the interstate to serve this site. And I guess that's what. Um, Mr. Dasker and I talked about discussing tonight. I would be open to answering any questions, and we could do more detailed presentation of, of what those look like if, if you so choose to, to have us do that. Mr. Schneider, if the uh, city doesn't provide water or sewer, what are their options? So I'll let, I'll let Mr. Pearson discuss that, but I think they do have some options to serve it in the rural or in the county yet. Uh, yeah, we would use the uh, rural water system in there. We'd have to put our own fire suppression tanks and, and pumps and all that stuff in there mm -hmm. to, to provide that. And then we would have our own uh, sewer system. Septic, basically. Yes. yes. A drain yeah. field, yeah. Yep. yeah. Septic system. Scott, I mean, if we did put this system in for $1.9 million, I mean, how much could we serve with that? I mean, what is is that enough to serve a lot of that area or is that this is just enough to get so on the sewer side it was really um if you're familiar with the train out there there's there's a coulee that crosses the interstate just west of their site it would serve like about 50 acres of sewer in that area on the water side though it would be set up to serve a lot more of the whole entire area of the uh, the interchange area and then it would tie into the water eventually up into sundance coves and that whole area and then really it's an expansion of that pressure zone to north, which is all the area north, the north side of Dickinson. But their site could be served out of the pressure zone one, which is the same pressure zone that Public Works is in, that the East Business Loom area is in. But their site elevation wise, we could serve out of pressure zone one right now. So the next site north of them or up the hill a little further, we'd have to put a booster station in and more infrastructure to keep serving north if this area would would grow and then annexation would of course be part of that process as well. I mean, I remember at one time there was talk about bringing sewer across there, you know, to go up behind Sundance and, you know, for that, that land that's been farmland for years, you know, I mean, so that would essentially be able to serve some of that area? On the sewer a little bit, but the best option is to just serve their site with a small sewer and about 50 acres on the, on kind of on the west side of their site right now for sewer. There was a, a lot more expensive option uh, to serve a lot bigger area. Pipes were bigger, a lot deeper. But the, the least expensive option was to serve a smaller area just west of their site and across the interstate. When you, when you say a lot more expensive, how much? I think it was, uh, well, I have the numbers here. So about another million dollars to cross the interstate with a bigger pipe for a bigger area. And if you separate it out, if you just did water and not sewer so water was the more expensive of the two um probably around nine hundred thousand for the water so just water yeah it's a 12 inch pipe it's a lot further distance to get from energy drive north across the interstate and then we're also crossing the east business loop or old highway 10 so we've got two highway crossings in there so is there any interest from businesses along that line to connect because they're probably all on rural right now. They would be all on rural water, yes, um, President Decker. There, there's one property north of the interstate that's currently annexed that doesn't have city services. So they would most likely connect if we went right by them, right? But that would be the only business that would be in the city limits that would connect. The other businesses, that, as far as I know, there hasn't been discussions with other business owners okay. to connect or annex 
I know. I mean, I know the industrial park that's across the street, basically. And I mean, they don't have. I don't think Southwest Water even has capacity for any of that stuff out there right now. So yeah, I'm I'm not sure if they do or not. Yeah. So I mean, there's probably a possibility they would take at least water, but. Do, do we know what like their annual water usage would be? Do you have a ballpark on that? At this moment, I do not have those numbers. I can pull those and bring those though. Okay. I mean, so if we did just find a way to provide water, I mean, would we still annex them then? Or is, what's your recommendation on that? <laughs> I, I guess we could always look into that possibility. Um, I guess that'd be up to the, the yeah, are we talking annexation be, here, or are we just talking we, providing I, we, water I, and sewer? Well, I think we were talking annexation with yeah. water and sewer. Uh, Mr. Correct? President, members of the commission, so right now this property is outside city limits. Right. So with an annexation application or request from uh, from Goose Deck, there'd be some expectations from the city. One would be to provide you know, municipal water services, municipal service, uh, sewer services, and also fire flow protection. That would come as part of the, the annexation request conditions. But we currently don't have that request. Correct. They do not have an official request for annexation in. No, yet. we have not done a, a official request, but if, if those services were provided, we would. Okay. okay. So, so would you consider putting a drain field in and us finding a way to bring you water until we figure out what we can do there? I mean, to, to give you an answer to bring $2 million worth of services to you just to serve you is going to be pretty tough. Yes, I, I understand that that's, that's, that's going to be very tough. I was hoping this would be a spur, spur off for you for more development up in the future. That's why we are willing to put $350,000 towards this. I know it's uh, 1.9. When we were talking, it was more like 1.3 when we started talking about this. So, you know, then it looked pretty reasonable, I thought, at that time. Uh, now it's, it is, costs have went up pretty drastic. I mean, I, 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 I mean, remembering back when we participated with the Roars situation, I mean, there was multiple users and subdivisions and stuff going to be coming online, not just one sim single user. So, do we, do we have any idea on any potential growth? Has there been any talk about development out there in terms of residential or additional commercial or industrial? So since I've been involved, involved in plan review services and helping with development, I have not heard of any additional development. Maybe there's some, been some rural things going on, but nothing in terms of requesting for city city services that I know, Mr. Oderman. The, the area out there, I don't know if you're familiar with it, from their location drops off pretty substantially yep. and to a pretty big coolie type so yeah, anything like a drain field. have to go further north development wise so um, and then there's the farm to the east of them so there's not a whole lot of room for development besides going north so this so. this might be an incredibly stupid question but what about running something from Sundance Coves is that cheaper if we wouldn't have to run underneath the interstate so on the sanitary sewer service side, we'd have to pump it. We'd have to build a lift station. Um, so then, yeah, so it, probably not. Probably not on the sewer yeah, side. Yeah. And the water is just a lot further away. So I, I think water would probably okay. be a wash on the okay. water. I, without doing the numbers, I wouldn't know, but just estimating. Yeah. Is there any easement issues? We, we haven't dug into that there there may be um to be because determined. once we get i mean probably with dot we don't have an issue getting mm -hmm. underneath the highway no no that's correct yep but then the adjoining especially the water because the water's got to run um if we don't have easement on that road to run it to their property yeah, we're, we're doing high-level planning here, so we haven't dug into the details yeah. on all those things yet, so really to be determined. So, so I mean, I, I would be interested. I, I, uh, I'd really like to see what we can do to try to make this happen, but um, I'm with Commissioner Frederick. Like, 
is there a, um, can we can we justify the expenditure with no um, potential future development out there at this time? But you know, if we're crossing the interstate, are there some of those other businesses that would be willing to to hook in? What what does that water use look like? I'd be really interested in what Goosenecks water usage is because if we can justify it from that standpoint of hey, this is a um, might be a longer payoff, but like this is the additional water usage and what water that we're going to sell to Gooseneck over a 10 to 20 year period. Um, and if this is something that we eventually are going to do, um, you know, 10, 15 years down the line because of development, it's going to be cheaper to do it now than it is then, uh, significantly cheaper. So um, I I is it a good investment um, from that standpoint, like doing it now? Um, getting this hook up across the interstate and under the interstate now um, and, you know, having that payoff down the road. Um, I, but, yeah, th th those are numbers that I'd be, I'd be interested in seeing because I think you said there's one business on the west side of the interstate that would maybe be potentially tie into it. Yeah, they're just on the north side of the interstate. On the, they'd be on the northeast corner of that interchange. Um, you, if you can see it in the photo, actually, it's I think it's Centennial Homes. Correct me if I'm wrong. Was that okay. the right business yeah. name? They're actually an, they're in the city limits, but they don't have services, water or okay. sewer. Okay. Mm. So they're on the south side of high, Old Highway 10. So yeah. So yeah, I mean, I'd be I'd be I'd be yep. really interested in in hearing um, if there's other businesses that maybe are interested in annexation and city services and and tying in and and what kind of um, enterprise revenue we're looking at there. Um, and then also the the gooseneck, what what your guys's water usage looks like, because um, we need to be able to justify this this expenditure. And um, so your participation amount, where did you come up with that number? Is that what it would cost you to do on site fire yes. protection? Yes, that's that's for us to put our sanitary sewer in and our fire protection. Mr. President, commissioners, I guess I have a question from a legal perspective. Um, this discussion, or, or is the commission, I think it, it's annexation or not annexation. Um, are you looking to have them annex? Uh, because then the second question would be, do we have any other situations currently where the city would be providing services, water or sewer, to something outside of city limits? I know we do have some of that with um, the marathon facilities, and um, Mr. Zuroff isn't here to answer those questions, but I do, we provide reuse water and, and so forth. So with the, to, um, Mr. Oderman's questions about the other facilities, I, I think that would be a leading to a larger question sure. with regard to annexation, because then we're, we're getting into county areas, and then also to um, Southwest Water will have, a, have to have a say in that as well because we're getting into their territory with their customers. And that agreement we just signed last meeting will come into play with regard to this. So kind of a, a broad uh, strokes uh, question um, on how that would look initially coming out of the gate. I mean, if we're going to, I mean, if we put the services in, we'd want to annex them, I'm, I'm assuming, right? Or else we wouldn't get any property tax. Right. I would hope so. Well, and, and that's another and that's another element of this too. Is um, what are the property tax revenue implications of this? I mean, like, what what are we going to generate from a property tax standpoint? Um, are we? Th that's those are numbers that are are, are valuable here as well, because that's another justification we can utilize to say, hey, you know, we we made this expenditure, but um, over the course of uh, ten years, this is what the property tax revenue implications are, and this is how we're going to pay for this. Uh, you know, it might be an extended payoff, but um, I mean, th 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 those are the type. That's the type of information we need so that we can justify this to taxpayers and the in the community. I think typically in the past we've had the request for annexation before we've had the request for services. Okay. So, so it, it seems to me that um, that would be the logical course of action right. uh, because then at the that juncture I think it's easier to provide city sewer and services to something that's been annexed in but so Mr. Schneider what size sewer and water you, would you bring if it was just for them and what size would it be if we plan for the future out there 
so the sewer size is eight to 10 inch and that does serve that 50 acre area um, around their site to the west. And then the water was 12 inch water, but that was for the whole area. That <coughs> out there. Um, I don't think we sized it just for their lot because we were sizing it on an interim basis, but yet could be used for this site and beyond. I'm not sure, Mr. Pearson, if you guys had sizes for your own of what you just need for your own site. No, we did not do that. Um. But our, our sizes, the city sizes are really driven by, by fire protection services. We need a 12 inch to get those kind of fire flows up into that area. And the, and the 12 inch would just say by chance, further to the east. How much could that service to the east? Uh, we have to take a look at that. We, we, this was on interim basis to get them their water. We could take a look and see how far we could get with that and, and what the next step would be. Um, I would venture to say several properties to the east would could be served off of that 12 inch. But again, it would need the booster station because we're going uphill. Their elevation works. But as soon as we go east, we're going to go uphill, right, to the mm -hmm. east. Then we're going to need the booster station, so another piece of infrastructure. Well, I'm, I'm talking more of the stuff on the south side of the interstate. West. I'm, well, I mean. Southeast. The, would be the, you know, you know, where the Peterbilt dealership, Rough Rider Homes. I mean, that whole it's industrial the, it's park. Highway 10. Yeah, yeah, that whole industrial park back there. I mean, would that be able to be served with this water line? You know, I think they're lower. I think they're higher than Gooseneck's site, so we have to build the booster station. Doesn't seem higher, but maybe. Yeah, we could take a look at that. I mean, because if that, I mean, if there's some odd possibilities of at least serving that with water, you know. And Tom, you said if if we um, we don't go ahead with this, you're just going to tie into rural water and build your own. Okay, that is correct. And I guess at that time, I don't see the reason why we'd want to annex into the into right. the city at that. Point. I, I wouldn't see it. Either, yeah, be, so because now it's kind of the old chicken and the egg thing here. I guess you know I've heard that we want to have us apply for annexation before we consider this. Well, if we're not going to receive any services. I don't see the reason for us to apply. So we kind of got that going on now, too. Yeah. Well, we, we have to weigh the cost. Yep. And if we're serving just one business, it makes it very tough for us. So. I mean, what kind of timing would it take to get a study together to figure out what we would exactly need to service that industrial park out there if we, I mean, I mean, we've never studied it before, so it's going to no. take some time, I'm assuming. Yeah, we studied this site on an interim basis last, last fall. And it, this memo was provided in January, so it would take us you know, some time to take a look at what the land use is and try and put a plan together for this whole area, at least a couple months probably before we'd be back here. This would be the plan for this whole area, water and sewer. Um, I have a question. What on that side of the interstate exchange is part of Centennial Homes is the only thing that's part of its town right now? Correct. Okay. And and remind me um, in detail a little bit more what, what our water, what, what we have with Southwest Water. Can we only service what's in the city once we're outside of the city limits, then, then we're not allowed to service them? Or remind me a little bit more on that agreement. Sure, Commissioner Sobolok. So how the agreement works, uh, Scott, are these in that industrial park, are they currently served by Southwest Water? I, I, uh, Attorney Winkle, I was assuming they were, but uh, I, I, I think, think there was a they, comment earlier that they might not be, Mr. Frederick. Well, there's, I, I know there's a new building going up out there right now, and they were not able to serve it. Okay, so they're drilling wells. So and, some people have wells out there. Okay. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Okay. I, I mean, not to say that that's not going to change when they have their new infrastructure mm -hmm. done, but. Mm -hmm. 
I, I think based on our conversations with uh, Southwest Water, because this, this was a topic of discussion when we, we met with them recently uh, in how we're gonna handle new development specifically in this area. And um, if it's an existing customer of Southwest Water, the city has to pay Southwest Water to get those customers. I think the larger question becomes is, I don't know as if we can assume that it's just gonna, the city's just gonna take over those customers because then I think it goes back to those customers on whether they're gonna annex into the city or mm -hmm. want to, because then we're finding ourselves in a situation again where we would be providing city services to properties that are outside city limits. Not saying it can't be done, but um, you know, I think that that's a policy uh, uh, concern for you as in deciding how you wanna handle that. So there's going to be a lot of moving parts uh, to this if you decide to go that route. Um, and, and that would require conversations, again, with Southwest Water um, and, and figuring out exactly what that's going to look like and, and who has you know, what capacity. I, I, like I said, we did talk about this, um, and I think there is some sort of line out there. We'd have to get that information from them uh, to make sure that they did have capacity. Uh, there is the provision that the city would have some priority in, in, in asking for new infrastructure within the one mile zone uh, from city limits, but that doesn't apply to existing customers. So we'd have to work that out to make sure that that was feasible. Uh, so what, what kind of um, responsibility or expectation do we have for that sliver that is annexed into the city to provide them city services? Are you talking about the Centennial Homes yeah. sliver? Because right now uh, we don't have the services there. So what, I mean, what responsibility to, do we have to that taxpayer? Well, generally when you annex in, uh, obviously that would come with the thought process that the city services would be available. It's the same concern that we're having up north with the uh, 40th Street and the conversation about bringing that um, into compliance and bringing city water and services, sewer services there too. So I'm not sure how that got annexed in initially, but it is in. Um, so, you know, long-term planning, we'll certainly take a look at it. Um, but if you're going to annex, I think the thought process would be is that you're going to provide the service. Do we know when that was annexed in and why? I have no idea. In the last five to six years. It was during the boom. So You're talking do about we Centennial know why, though? Homes area? Oh, this Centennial Homes yeah. or the stuff up north? No, Centennial Homes. No, the homes. Centennial Homes stuff has been... It's forever? Yeah, I think it's just been the way the city boundary was, even I, oh, okay. how it was constructed. That one I don't and, know. And the, the north side was early, like, 2010, 2011, somewhere. Okay. But it was bef before I was on the commission, so... But... I, like I said, the challenge is, is us looking at right now, I mean, what's presented to us, we're providing to one for $2 million. We're providing to one business, one location. And that's what makes it, it, it hard to make any kind of commitment to, I mean, that's, that's a difficult sell to the general public just for one business so it's a, it's a potentially easier sell with some additional information though i i i, I don't want to give up on this because I, I do think that it's a great project for dickinson um and this is gonna i mean <laughs> if we do it 10 years down the road it's going to be double what we're looking at now from a cost perspective um but uh yeah so you're looking for a yay or nay or i i, I mean it's, that, that's the problem i uh, we're not, I'm not looking for a, a decision today if that's what you're asking that's, that's okay. not what, because well, I, I, mean, I don't think you were going to get one no so. because this is the first time you guys have had this presented yeah. to you i understand that um, again, I guess I understand that yes, right now we're potentially the only person that would be using this. We're also willing to pay basically a third of that cost at, at 350000 too. So for future development, I, I'm just going to say, you know, if we go forward and do it all internally, and in 10 years, we may not want to hook up at that time. So there's that also. I just want to make sure we're aware of that is, is you know, we're willing to today, but down the road, it could be may not be something that we'll be interested in participating in. 
Okay, uh, so we're since we're not making a decision, it is a public uh, hearing. So we will, if yeah, unless you have any anything further, Mr. Schneider, anything, city staff, anything further? Okay, I'll open up public hearing. If anyone wants to come forward, please state your name. Let us know if you have any concerns or comments about. Um, the possibility of the city providing sewer and water to the gooseneck development. You can also, if you're watching online, call 701-456-7006. Again, if you have any concerns or comments about the um, city participating in a cost share for water and sewer to the gooseneck development. Anyone from the public? Anyone from the public have any concerns? Seeing no one has any concerns or questions on the city's participation in the gooseneck development, providing water and sewer and close the public hearing. I guess I, I have one final question. What I guess is the timeline, your ultimate timeline for us to, uh, I guess, provide you with an answer, are yay or nay? I know you're behind already three months, so. Uh, that, that's a very good question. Uh, I believe in the original developer's agreement, we said we would need to have services there August of 23. So we, we but, do it. But there's some planning that goes into it if you're getting it from us or not. So you well, have to design somehow. Well, we already, we're, I'm going to be honest, we're designing that we're not going to receive them. So okay. basically, we're going to have the facility ready to do, do it that way. And if you come back. Okay. So you're moving time, dirt now. Uh, we're going to be here in 30 days. We're going to be moving okay. dirt. That is correct. Hopefully it doesn't. We don't have the torrential downpours, and you have <laughs> you have an outdoor pool I was talking about earlier. So, but yeah. So I think if we got some additional information, like Commissioner Oderman, Commissioner Frederick said, we get some additional information. If there's potential um, other businesses that might tie in, might make this a little bit easier. You got but, some employees that want to build houses out there. <laughs> But uh, right now, I think we just need a little bit more information, so. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right, commissioners. Um, public comments not on the agenda. If you uh, are in the audience right now and you want to come forward and discuss anything that was not on the agenda this evening or anything that was on the agenda, please come forward, state your name and let us know um, your concerns or questions for this commission or city staff. Again, you can call 701-456-7006 and voice your concerns, uh, comments or questions on anything that was not on the agenda or items that were on the agenda. Anyone from the public? Anyone? Please come forward. Yeah, I just got a couple things. So, Please state your name and your. Uh, oh yeah, Jason O'Day, uh, Dickinson resident. Um, yeah, so first uh, I'll go with the, the speed limits. I think they're a little too uh, too low. Uh, so I remember it was a I think it was a Dickinson Chamber of Commerce event that I was at in February, and some lady was talking about how great it was that you can get anywhere in Dickinson, like be anywhere in Dickinson and get anywhere else in Dickinson in seven minutes and I was just thinking well not if you're going the speed limit you know because uh, like on Villard it's I think it's 25 uh, I live over on Westridge by Family Fair and it's uh, it's like 40 there I think that could be a little higher but um, yeah just something to consider also with the uh, the West River Community Center um, I realize this is a, a big ask and, and not something that could be done overnight but uh, and, and they have uh, done a good job of addressing it better recently. But the, um, like in the fitness center 
area, the weight room, like where the, the treadmills are and all that, a lot of times there'll be young kids just running around like wild animals and it's just kind of dangerous and, and also annoying to people who are trying to use th those facilities. Um, also, it, it closes at it, it closes at nine and eight on Sundays and that can be a little inconvenient. I, I think it should be open a little bit later. Uh, I've heard that before the pandemic, it was open about an hour or so later than that. I think that would be nice if if that could be if it could be switched back to that, you know. So it was it was like ten or, or ten thirty or whatever it was back then. Uh, that would be really convenient for a lot of people who use the gym. So uh, yeah, take that as you will. Um, okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, we'll, thank you. Thank you. We'll pass on the speed limits to our engineers and police department. See what the a lot of that, some of this is dictated by DOT, the speed limits. Um, and then with the fitness center, we'll pass on your concerns to the park board. And they are the ones that regulate that, so the park. So we'll pass, we'll pass on the, uh, I know the kids sometimes they do get a little bit out of control after four o'clock, it kind of turns into a daycare. <laughs> and then, right, uh, that, yeah. And that was, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I mentioned it, but uh, like if there could be some kind of a, a youth center there or, or something for them to do, because sometimes it can be like the, the preteen, like teenagers yep. too, that are, are just kind of creating a mess or, or hectic situation, you know. Yeah, the, and, the, and the times, again, we'll, we'll pass this on to the park board and their staff. Um, I think some of the time with the time issues is staffing. Mm -hmm. You know, they came back off the pandemic. They just didn't have the staff they used to. And so and getting somebody to work past nine o'clock is sometimes a little difficult. Yeah, exactly. We'll pass those concerns that. on. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again. All right. Thank I you. Appreciate it. Anyone else from the public? Anyone else? Close the public hearing for public comments. Commissioners, any items that were not, were not on the agenda or items you wish to discuss this evening so just to, just in light of the the gooseneck conversation I'd like maybe uh, city administrator Dossinger to just kind of update us on um, how things have changed with um, when, when when groups or developers uh, approach the city how, how we're changing that process because I know that there has been some changes um, I, I personally would like to see us have some type of deadline of when a developer presents a project to us that um, they have a deadline and say hey you know you you presented us with the information that we needed um, you're going to be in front of the city commission on this date um, and and basically put the onus back on city staff to have make sure that everything gets done in a certain timeline so that these developers aren't waiting forever to make sure that um, that they can get before us and, and, and get that stuff um, before planning and zoning so that it can get before us so that we don't have something like this happen with Gooseneck. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Commissioner Oderman. We certainly have made some adjustments. Uh, one of our, birth, our biggest issues at first was started with the intake process. Uh, certain things went to the planning department that should have went to the building official. Uh, certain things went to the building official that sh should have went to the planning department. So our intake process has changed. Um, if it's in an existing structure such as a uh, for example, a daycare that's moving into an existing structure within the, the city of Dickinson, um, that should directly go to the building official rather than the planning department. Uh, so we made changes there. One thing that we've made improvements on too is uh, when we seek comments from developers uh, before, we put the onus back on the developer in the past to get comments from all city staff. Uh, we were making changes, so now it's up to the person that owns that project within the city to seek comments from other departments so that those developers get one voice one contact person from the city. Um, obviously, every development is a little bit different as far as setting deadlines. Obviously, some are, are more complex than others. Uh, we're working on that. Uh, we have changed our site plan meetings that we meet uh, every week on to be relevant meetings. So now at those meetings, we have everybody from the fire department chief, uh, the fire inspector, public works, um, uh, Mr. Ann Prowse sits in there regarding the sanitation part of it, uh, engineering. So we're all there. So every, everyone gets a look at these projects coming in. We are all able to provide comments. Uh, additionally, knowing what tasks are needed for the city to, to follow through with these projects. Uh, unfortunately, some of these past projects, such as this gooseneck project, had fell through the cracks. 
Um, Mr. Pearson uh, and, and the Goose Lake development is certainly very uh, patient with the city of Dickinson. It was important to move this project along and get in front of the, the commission uh, when we did. This project honestly should have been in front of the commission months ago uh, for, for direction. So we're, we're definitely trying to make improvements in that pr process. Obviously, we're reviewing the planning department right now as far as what steps to, to move forward as far as uh, potentially place, replacing that position. Um, and also, you know, we're waiting for, we've gotten some good applicants uh, that had applied for the, the city engineer slash development director position. So we're excited to start sifting through those interviewers as, as well and see where we can take our development uh, department in the future for the city. Right. Yeah, I, I just thought that was a valuable <coughs> update for um, other commissioners that hadn't talked to you about that and, and then the public too, because I think you've done some good work there. So thank you for that. And a lot of work, you know, uh, as came from Mr. Schneider's provided some excellent feedback on that process as well as long as uh, I think everybody knew that there needed to be improvements there it was just a matter of getting it implemented and, and making those steps okay anything else commissioners for a motion to adjourn so moved. second we are adjourned <laughs>